You are trapped in the dank darkness of a ruined plantation house. And somewhere in the pitch black room is a homicidal maniac armed with a knife groping for you, trying to prevent your escape. Escape, produced by William N. Robeson, directed tonight by Richard Sanville, and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to a deserted sand pit off the coast of Georgia, where terror stalks under the Spanish moss, as Joseph Hergesheimer tells it in Wild Oranges. What could have appeared more innocent of danger than that barren, low-lying shore of southern Georgia? What could have seemed less laden with terror than that lovely little cove so tranquil and well-sheltered, so warmly bathed in late afternoon sun as we dropped the anchor of our catch and prepared our mooring? And yet there was something. First it was an odor of a grove of wild orange trees in late bloom growing defiantly amid the tangled undergrowth of the shore. The scent was strong and exotic and heady, and as I smelled it, I felt a vague uneasiness. Then as I watched the shore and Halvard, sole member of my crew, furled the sails, the mirror of the cove was shattered by a movement. First I thought it was a fish leaping and playing in the water. It came round a spit of land from an in inner bay, and then Halvard was beside me. Uh, that's queer, sir. Huh? I would have bet there was nobody within miles of here. But there's someone swimming. Huh? Yes. It's a girl. Aye. She'll be surprised when she discovers us, no doubt. <laughs> and embarrassed. <laughs> oh, she swims well, doesn't she? As if she's been born in the water. Ah, yeah. That, that she's seen us. Yes. <laughs> now she's running away. That sprint would win an Olympic race. I wonder what she's doing here, where she comes from. Uh, perhaps there. Hmm? Where? Through the trees. There's a house. You can hardly see it. I, I spotted it a moment ago. Oh, yes, yeah. so there is. Oh, but it's a ruin. It's rotting away. No one could have lived in that since the Civil War. Well, there may be others back there. Yes, but this coast is deserted. Marked a swamp on the chart. Well, I don't know, sir. Hmm. It's strange. Very strange. Yes, it was strange. And stranger still was this vague uneasiness I felt. As twilight fell, the aroma of the wild oranges was overpowering. Suddenly, without knowing why, I slipped on a jacket, went to the side and dropped into the tender. Halvard stood by to cast off. He asked no questions, and I said nothing. <laughs> what could I say? I didn't know myself why I was going. I pulled the tender up on the soft sand of the beach and walked up a dim path through the orange grove. The scent of the blossoms was full of such wild sweetness that I picked an orange and tasted it. It was bitter, but of a pungence that was new and rare and strangely delicious. The dim moonlight only accentuated the ruin of the house. There were other smaller ramshackle buildings scattered about, overgrown with weeds and creeping vines. This had once been a great plantation. Now it lay still and lifeless. Then I saw the light. Round the side where a smaller portico held off the weeds a single doorway was framed in the pale light of an inner lamp. As I approached, I saw a shadow move across it, so swiftly, so furtively, that it was gone before I realized it had been a man. Then I saw her, sitting on the portico, rocking softly in her chair. What do you want? Uh, nothing. When I came ashore, I thought no one was living here. You're from the white boat that sailed in at sunset? Yes, and I'm returning immediately. It was like magic. Suddenly, without a sound... You were anchored in the bay. I... I've robbed you, too. Some of your oranges are in my pocket. You won't like them. They've run wild. We can't sell them. They have a distinct flavor of their own. I should be glad to have some on my boat. All you want. My man will get them and pay you. Please, don't. Oh, Nicholas attends to that. Oh, won't you sit down? My father was here when you came up, but he went in. Strangers trouble him. Why? Well, I... I should be getting back. I'm sorry to have disturbed you and your father. 
No. No, it was nothing. Good. Good night, then. Good night. That was all. A fragment of commonplace conversation. But it was enough. Now the uneasiness I felt, the strangeness of this place took shape for me. I saw it in her lovely, fragile face. I heard it in her voice. There'd been a hidden terror, a terrible, controlled fright that approached hysteria. There'd been a warning in it, and something else, a plea. By the time I got back to the boat, I was completely unnerved, and Halvard made matters worse. You find anything, sir? There are people living there. Well, there'll be water then. Maybe we could stay here a couple of days, huh? What do you mean? Well, this is good anchorage, sir. I'd like to unship the propeller, and the topside could do with a coat of varnish. No, we're going on south. Uh, aye, sir. No, no, wait, Halvard. Of course, you're right. We need a couple of days' work before we head into blue water. We'll do it here. And so we stayed. In the light of morning, the strange dread I'd felt seemed foolish, and especially when I went ashore and found the girl looking young and fresh and fragile, fishing off the little pier in the inner bay. She had a pathetic little rod and line, so... I got our tackle from the boat and landed a big rockfish for her, enough for several dinners. We were carrying the fish to the house when we came on a pale, thin ghost of a man sitting on the portico. He started a swift retreat, but too late. Father, wait. This is my father, Litchfield Stope. How do you do, sir? Merely, merely, you are no, I can't. Strange as they... Father, you must manage yourself better. You know I wouldn't bring anyone to the house who would hurt us. And see... We are fetching you a splendid rockfish. Oh, yes. So you are. We are alone here, sir. The man is away, my daughter and I. The fish, yes, acceptable. If you will carry it in for me. Nicholas would do it, but he's away. And the father isn't strong. This way. We have no ice. I must put it in water. In here, right there. Thank you. You've been very nice. Now I suppose you'll go on across the world. Not tonight. We're staying here, making repairs. Where do you come from? And where are you going? From Cape Cod. I'm going to the Guianas. Isn't that South America? I've traveled far on maps. I was born here in this house, and I've never been 50 miles away. Oh, well, that's incredible. You seem like a girl who's been everywhere in the world and had the best education, everything. My father has many books in there, that's all. You... Your eyes are remarkable. Gray-green like olive leaves and magnetic. I, I I came ashore to ask you if you had a large water supply and if I might fill my casks. Of course. Rainwater, the cistern's full. I'll send my man Halbert then. Yes. There, there's something else in your eyes, in your voice. What is it? Fear? Fear? Why, no, of course not. What should I be afraid of? I don't know. But I saw it in your father's face, too. It's only your imagination. Yes. Yes, no doubt. Goodbye, then. Thank you for the fishing. Strange how this girl should upset me so. I tried to resist, but that evening I found myself going back to her. Tying the tender to the little pier, I watched as she came to meet me. I'm glad you came. The fish way. Waited... Oh, don't tell me. I'd rather not know. I might be tempted to mention it in the future, and I'm sure it would sound like a fish story. <laughs> but it was imposing. Nicholas waited. He's our man. He's back. Let's stay here by the sea. It's so lovely in the moonlight. All right. Oh, it is nice here. I lied to you today. About fear. I suppose I am afraid. I suppose my father has passed some of his fear on to me. Why is he afraid? Well, that's a long story, going back to the first war. Please, tell me. Well, he was a young man then, and he didn't go to war. It wasn't that he was a coward, exactly. He just couldn't adjust to it, mentally. People mocked him, laughed at him, and threatened him. That's when a sort of perpetual fear started. He ran away. He met my mother and married her. They came here. None of us has ever left this lonely place. Never will, perhaps. Your mother? 
She's dead. Loneliness killed her. Perhaps it's no wonder that I sound timid or afraid. Perhaps I am. Aren't you lonely, too? I don't know anything else. But what about you? Who are you that you go sailing about the world with only your sailor for company? Oh, I'm, I'm nobody. My name is John Woolfolk. And you do nothing but sail about the world? Nothing. Why? Well, let's say I don't like modern society. Let's say I, I don't like entanglement. I see. Oh, I, I didn't mean... You needn't apologize. I envy you your freedom. I sit here a great deal and watch the ships far out there on their water roads. You are enviable. Sailing where you like. Safe and free. Safe and free. There is something more than you've told me. More behind this fear in your voice. No. But perhaps I can help. No. No, please. What's that? It's Nicholas. Blowing on the conch. I've got to go in. I'll come with you. No. No, please. No. Don't come. You'll be going soon. Tomorrow, perhaps. Then, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Now I knew the terror I'd only sensed was real. This girl was possessed by fear. This house held some terrible secret. What could it be? Next morning, Halbert suggested we repaint the engines, and I agreed. We'd stay another day or two. Later, Halbert went in to fill a cask of water. He came back without the cask and livid with rage. There was an idiot in that house. Next time, I'll take the pistol. What do you mean? Where's the cask? It was broken. How? It was filling it at the cistern, and this idiot, a huge hulking brute, came out of the house. He told me to get away. Well, I tried to explain that we had permission, but he came at me with a knife, gibbering. Well, I hit him, but it was like hitting an ox. He put his foot on the cask and crushed it. I'll see about this. Uh, you be careful, sir. The man's not right. He's dangerous. Plenty dangerous. I went ashore and around to the back door of the house. Millie wasn't in sight, and when I knocked, a lumbering giant with pig-like eyes came to the door. What do you want? I take it you're Nicholas, the man who broke my water cask. It was full of all water. I'm not going to argue with you. I came ashore to instruct you to keep your hands off my property and my sailor. Oh, let our water be. I told you I wouldn't discuss the matter. I don't have to justify myself to you. Just remember, keep your hands don't off. Don't get me started. What Listen, do you mean, started? You I... Don't get me started. Mind, I warned you. Put, and don't put get down me that knife. Go away now. Don't get me started. Stand Go back. away. Don't get me started. I'm telling you. Uh, Nicholas, stop. What is this? What's the matter? Nothing. Nicholas and I have had a little misunderstanding, that's all. Uh, it's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about, I said. But when I got back to the boat, I couldn't help asking myself why I'd left her with that brute. I just about made up my mind to go ashore again to check up when I saw her waving on the beach. She wanted to visit the boat. I went and got her. There was no hint of terror in her face now, just shining girlish wonderment at the polished metal and the gleaming wood of the catch. I offered to take her for a sail, and her face lighted up like a child's. But when we reached the heavy swells outside the reef, her face got white, and she froze. It's... it's so big. Are you frightened? I'll turn back. I'd rather you didn't. I must learn. I'm not a child. No, we're going back. Before we got to the anchorage, her panic was almost out of control. But safely moored once more, she calmed slowly and said... How strange... To be forced back to this place I loathe by my own cowardice. It's not cowardice. The sea is frightening to those unused to it. Come, you must forget it now. Halvard will have tea for us in a moment. Uh, how do you like our boat? It's quite wonderful. Have you nothing else to care for? No place or people on land? None. And you are satisfied? Hardly. All the things most men value were taken from me in an instant. Can you talk about it? Why, well, I, I haven't for 12 years. Not to anybody, but... Now? Yes, I, I think I can. You see, we were just married. Only a few days. And we were very, very happy. Then, in one instant, she was dead. It was a silly, stupid accident thrown from a horse. Without rhyme or reason. 
So you left everything, taking your revenge on the world. You could put it that way, I suppose. I simply don't want to take a second chance to become involved and be hurt. But that's living, to be hurt. Do you think you can escape so easily? I don't know. Oh, I must go. Uh, Father will be waiting. Why so suddenly? There's... Oh, yes, I see. That's Nicholas on the beach looking out here, isn't it? Yes, dinner will be ready. Why do you have a servant like that? That man's dangerous. You mustn't say that. Please don't. Just take me in, please. Now I knew that she too was afraid of Nicholas. I could see it in her eyes. Why then did I let her go to him? I don't know. I was confused, I guess. That night a storm broke, a raging wind and rain, and to match my tortured mood. I hardly slept, her face was always before my eyes, and by morning I knew that I must do something. I rode the tender in through a drizzling rain. I went up through the orange grove and stopped in the bushes by the house. Someone was coming out of the house, and I crouched down out of sight. It was Millie. I rose and called her. Millie! Oh, it's you. I was just coming out to look. I was afraid you'd gone out. The sea is like a pack of wolves. I won't go alone, not without you. What are you saying? That's madness. No, I, I've got to talk to you, Millie. Uh, there's a lot that needs explaining. Things that I have a right to no. know. No, not here. Come. She led me into one of the smaller ruined buildings, what must have been a store in the days of the great plantation. We crouched far back in the dripping shadows of a corner. No. Millie. Millie, I love you. For the first time in 12 years, I'm living again, and I love you. I know nothing of love. It's easily learned. Well, perhaps if things were different, someplace else, I might care very much. Then I'm going to take you away someplace else, make things different, give you the chance. No, it's too late. You came too late. Why, Millie, why? What is it? What is it you fear? Nicholas. Oh, he's nothing. Nothing to be afraid of. Has he been bothering you? He says he's crazy about me. He says I must marry him. Where is he now? No, you mustn't, John. Something frightful would happen. Not frightful, just unfortunate for Nicholas. You don't understand. He's not, not human. There's something about him. What about him? He came here in April. We were glad to get him. Servants are impossible to get back here in the wilderness. He would work for the smallest wages. Only a few days ago, I found out why he was glad to be here. I was cleaning his room, and I found this. Let's see. Wanted for murder. Iskan Nicholas, homicidal maniac. He knows I found it. He knows. And he's been furious. Then you came, and he ran and hid in the pines. But he told me if I spoke about it, then it would happen to me. And if I left with you, it would happen to Father. You see, he thinks I'm in love with you. He told me to send you away. He said you must leave today. Millie, I should have realized. He says I must not be away for longer than an hour. I must go. Look, Millie. It'll take us a couple of hours to get the boat ready. I'll come for you tonight at 8. Now, tell him you saw me and I promised to go. And act quietly. Say you, well, say you've been upset. You'll give him his answer tomorrow. Then at 8, bring your father and walk out to the wharf. That's all. But do it without hesitation or preparation. Oh, don't let him hurt us. Oh, please don't. Not now. He's finished, Millie. But do as I say. It won't be long, hardly three hours. And then, freedom. Now that I knew, now that there was to be action, I felt better. Halvard and I got the catch ready for sailing, and eight o'clock we tied it up to the little pier. The storm had abated slightly, but it was still raining. I got up on the dock and waited for Millie. Ten minutes passed, then twenty. Something was wrong. I told Halvard to wait there with the tender. Then I walked slowly up to the house. It was dark. I went up to the side portico to the heavy door. A tiny crack of light showed under it. I pushed it open. The light came from a parlor to the right. I looked in. On the floor lay a body. Old Litchfield Stope, he was dead, crushed. His arm twisted grotesquely under him. There was not a sound in the house. 
Slowly, I walked through the downstairs rooms. Nothing. And back in the hall, I heard a slight creak. Upstairs, someone had moved. Was it Millie, alive? Or Nicholas, lying in wait? I groped slowly up the stairs. I did not use my flashlight. It would have made me a target for his knife. The upstairs hall was pitch black, and still there was no sound. I inched my way along the wall, slowly. Then I stumbled on a loose board. The pistol flew out of my hand, but the stumble saved my life. The same instant I felt Nicholas <laughs> lunge, heard the knife sing past my ear and thud into the wall, felt his great bulk smashing on my shoulders. My gun was somewhere on the dark floor. His knife was embedded in the wall. Now we were grappling hand to hand, rolling on the floor, kicking, tearing, gouging, crushing. My strength and wit against the massive bulk of a maniacal killer. I... <laughs> How many minutes did that unequal struggle last? I, I don't know. It seemed an hour. Several times, as if by common consent, we rested for minutes at a time, locked in tight embrace. Once we rolled apart and lay panting, the breath aching in my throat. Then I heard him groping along the wall, searching for the knife or the gun. I threw myself on him again, but he was too big, too furious. I felt my strength ebbing away. His fingers were closing over my throat. With one last effort, I tried to throw him off to roll him over. I, I staggered dazedly to my feet and looked up. He'd fallen through the banister down the stairwell. Nicholas had landed on the bottom. He lay there on the stairs, sprawled, his head at a grotesque angle. But he was not dead, only stunned. I leaned against the wall, looked at him stupidly. There was something, there was something I was trying to remember. What was it? Then she came down the steps and I remembered. Millie. I had to walk right past him. There was no other way. Right past his head and my skirt. I think we better go away. It's quite impossible here with him in the hall. We have to pass so close. Millie, yes, we'll leave at once. I must tell you about my father. You know, in Virginia, the women tied an apron on the door because he would not go to war, and that preyed on his mind, and he was afraid of the slightest thing. Yes, yes, I know, but we must go. Things upset him, so he had no strength. To hear him talk he, like this, like a sick child, was almost more than I could bear. Place, I don't but now I heard something. Nicholas boy. had gotten up. He stood there and stared for a moment at us. Then he started slowly up the stairs. He was going for the, the knife. This little thing upsets him. Millie, but we've got to go. I was to meet a man. We were going away someplace where it'd be peaceful. He said at eight o'clock. But Nicholas suspected, you see. He asked why Father had put on his heavy winter clothes. Then when I tried to go out, he pushed me. Millie. And do you know what Father did then? He came up and he said, Don't do that. Take your hands off my daughter. His lips shook a little, but he said it. That's the important thing. Yes, yes, of course. Your father was a brave man, after all. Now, come, that man is waiting for you. There's no time to lose. Father said, take your hands off my daughter. Nicholas killed him, of course. Crushed him like a little mosquito. But it was a brave thing to do. I couldn't wait any longer. I had to risk whatever injury it might do to her mind. I could hear Nicholas coming back. I swept her up in my arms and carried her out into the night, down the path to the little pier. Behind me, I could hear Nicholas crashing through the brush like a giant animal in pursuit. Are you all right, sir? Yes, about done in, but all right. Here, help me get her in the boat. Yes, yeah, sir. There. Yeah. Somebody's coming. It's Nicholas. He's got a knife. Good. They wanted to get back at him. You get in, sir. I'll take care of him. Albert went to intercept Nicholas on the path. I heard them meet and struggle for a moment. Then a stooped figure came walking slowly onto the pier. I prepared to shove the boat out into the water and then... All right, sir. It's me. Oh, Halbert. Where's Nicholas? They stopped him. He was all pumped out. Are you hurt? No, just a scratch. He missed his knife at first in the dark. It's nothing. Good. Let's get away from here then. I held Millie in my arms as Halbert rode to the catch erratically, I suppose, because of the storm. We were ready to cast off in two minutes. The last obstacle would be the narrow passing out of the cove. In this storm, it would be dangerous, very dangerous. I started to take Millie into the cabin. No! There's Nicholas! In the doorway! Nonsense! Nicholas is dead! 
You're on my boat, Millie. You're safe, Millie. Safe? With John Woolfolk? I am John Woolfolk. But he... You didn't come. Yes, I did, Millie. And you're safe. Come. I want to stay here. All right. You sit here beside Halvard. I'm going up front to take soundings. In this van, you won't be able to hear me if I call. No, but you can hear me. Remember, we've only three feet clearance. We'll have to hold it steady through the passage. Oh, I'll manage it. Halvard, this is no time for pretense. How do you feel? All right. I've taken knives before. Just to scratch. All right, we'll fix it as soon as we get outside. Now let's go. Turn over the engines. Pull up anchor. The boat headed into the tearing wind of the storm, sped swiftly toward the narrow inlet. A foot too far on either side and we would hit. In this sea, that would mean death for us all. I stood far up on the bow, taking soundings, feeling out the passage. Four! The howling wind carried my call back to Halvard. The boat veered. I realized he must have lost a lot of blood. Halvard! Halvard, steady her! Slowly, haltingly, it came around. Three and a half! Steady now! But it was anything but steady. The boat waved and swung as if an amateur hand were on the wheel. In a moment, we might hit. Three and a quarter! We were in the passage. Hold steady, Halvard! Steady! For just another moment! Just one moment! Three and a half! We're through! Good boy, Halvard! Good boy, Halvard, I called. But when I went back, it, it was not Halvard at the wheel. It was Millie. Millie, her hands steady, her eyes washed clear of any madness. Millie with a tight little smile on her face, but no fear. And Halvard lay rolling with the swells in the bottom of the cockpit. I'm afraid he's dead, John. He was wounded worse than you thought. Halvard dead? He told me to take the wheel. Said it was life or death. Then he slid down like that. When? When was this? Back there on the passage. Just when you said three and a half. I'm afraid I wasn't very good. But I held on. Oh, Millie. You were wonderful. No. Not yet. But I'll learn, John. I'll learn. Escape is produced by William N. Robson and was directed tonight by Richard Sanville. You have just heard Wild Oranges by Joseph Hergesheimer, adapted for radio by John Dunkel, with Paul Fries as John Woolfolk, Jeanette Nolan as Millie Stopes, Bill Conrad as Halvard, Jack Crucian as Nicholas, and Sherry Hall as Litchfield Stopes. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You've planned it very well. She's dead, and you feel no remorse. Your escape has worked out perfectly. There's nothing to worry about, except perhaps an unexpected Christmas present. <laughs> Next week, we escape with John Collier's grim story, Back for Christmas. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>